So moving onward, talk a little bit about genes. Okay, genes are composed of DNA and the three key features of genes that really need to be included in any definition of a gene is that they can be copied, replicated. They are then inherited and then they need to be expressed in a living cell. Okay, and so genes and other elements are what make up a complete genome of an organism. So individuals of the same species will have the same genes in the same positions. Okay, so this means, this is referring to the locus, so the location of a gene on a chromosome. You're always going to find the gene uh, 9q34 at this particular position on the chromosome 9, and that's going to determine what your blood type is. Now you might have different alleles. Okay, you might have the A, uh, the a allele, the B allele, or the O allele, of that gene um, at that locus. So the actual DNA might be different depending on what allele you have, but you're always gonna find that gene in that spot at that locus. Okay? Now, when we determine what all of these genes are and find out where they are in relation to each other or even their exact location on the chromosome, that's what's referred to as a genetic map, sort of being an atlas of positions. So. If you give somebody directions to your house, you can either give them the exact GPS coordinates, which may or may not be useful, or you can tell them uh, the street address that might be easier for them to use, or you might be able to tell them just relational. Hey, if you're starting at the school, you're going to need to go down Euclid, and then you're going to have to take a left on the Comstock, and then you're going to have to look for the you know, large tree where you take a right. That's also kind of giving people a map, but in a different way, a more relational way. So a lot of the older genetic maps are um, genes in relation to one another, how far away they are from each other. And newer maps are ones that can literally say, this is how many base pairs down the end of the chromosome this gene is. So all genes are composed of DNA, but not all the DNA in our cells actually constitutes a gene. There's a whole lot of other DNA that's either involved in regulatory uh, functions like being a promoter or silencer, or it's uh, junk DNA left over from a viral infection. So the exact percentage of the genome that actually encodes a gene that codes for a protein varies between organisms. So over here, bacteria, basically most of the genome is functional. That's sort of their thing is to have exactly what they need and nothing else. Um, if we look at worms or flies, about 35% of the genome is exon or protein coding. And then in humans, only 2% of our genome is exon, but like 75% of it is transcribed and might be functional like non-coding RNAs and such. So in general, more complex organisms have more protein coding genes, but that makes up a lower percentage of their DNA. So worms and humans have similar numbers of protein coding genes, uh, but uh, the human genome is 30 times larger. We've just accumulated a whole lot more uh, DNA uh, over time, and a lot of that is, is due to um, a lot more gene regulation and, and sites and junk DNA and all sorts of things piling up over time. So if we take a base in the genome at random and change it, is there going to be a functional consequence? And this is basically what happens continuously as species um, live and evolve for time. So what we're talking about is if we take this little sequence of DNA and we take this one little letter, this G, how will that affect the genotype? So in bacteria, that's actually a very high likelihood of change because everything in the bacteria has some sort of function. It's slimmed down. Most of the genome is actively a gene, but the change could just be like a third base change, a wobble, where um, the base changes, say, ATG here. Well, in this case, it would change because it's a part of a start codon or a methionine. Um, or it could be conservative substitution where the amino acid swaps, but it's not a big change, like it's a polar amino acid switches to a different polar amino acid, so the um, protein still acts in the same way. Or it could just be redundant information. You could have multiple copies of this gene, and if you change one, the other two are going to function. It's not going to be a problem. Okay, and Worms are flies, so the likelihood is lower because only about 35% of the genome is exon. But So it could be the similar idea where it's a third base change and nothing is really happening to that particular uh, protein. Uh, it could also be in a duplicated pathway. There's another way to make that particular end product 
So if you lose one stretch of road, it doesn't matter. You've got another way to go. It could be in a recessive allele, so it wasn't going to get expressed anyway. And then in humans, the likelihood of that change via one mutation is extremely low because of how little of the genome is um, actually coding for proteins. But again, it could still be that recessive allele or the base change or such. So we call this um, various forms of redundancy and robustness kind of buffer against massive changes in the genome. So now we're going to discuss a little more about genetic change and these terms redundancy and robustness. So if the probability of this single base change has a significant functional consequence, that probability is low, then where does all this diversity for natural selection come from? Well, even if the probability is low, you have many mutations happening, um, basically at many different locations within the chromosomes at the same time, and you have this occurring in all the different individuals in the population over either the, the lifespan of the organism and over the, um, the lifespan of the population at large. So they're just accruing and accruing over time, and you get this accumulated effect, and that's what is providing the genetic diversity of evolution. Not just that you know, 2% chance that this one base changes, but that 2% chance multiplied over the length of your chromosomes over every individual in the population over time. Okay. So mutations just build up in the genome of all these cells, and most mutations really don't matter a whole lot, or they're selectively neutral. Like if um, you get a, a change in just a few skin cells in your body, unless it's cancer, that's not going to matter a whole lot, uh, unless it severely um, affects your reproductive fitness. Okay. And so the ones that super matter are the ones that occur in your um, reproductive organs and in the cells that might be passed on to a new generation. Okay? So the minority of my, uh, mutations have any significant consequences, but those are the ones that really matter. The very, very few that do have a significant impact are the ones that are going to lead to a phenotypic difference, and then that is something that um, selection can act upon and lead to evolutionary change. So those two terms we mentioned before, redundancy and robustness, the idea of redundancy is that, you know, somebody's being redundant, they're saying something they've already said before. So um, the idea being instead of just one road between your two towns here, you now have two rows, the redundant. But if uh, there's more than one version of the same information, like uh, you should be storing all of your important school documents on a USB drive. Just copy them over, and now you have a redundant backup. But if something happens to your computer, you've got somewhere uh, else you can go for that information. So some examples of this in biology are degeneracy in the genetic code, where different codons, um, maybe three or four codons, all code for the same amino acid. So if there's a, a minor change to the DNA sequence, you still might end up with the same amino acid. Uh, multiple members of a gene family. Um, genes have been duplicated and copied, and you have similar genes that are doing similar functions. And then uh, even just being diploid, you have two copies of every gene, thanks to having two chromosomes. Okay. Robustness is even sort of a stronger pattern than redundancy, where you have multiple routes of getting to the same place. So via town one to town five, there are multiple pathways there that can be taken. Uh, you can go through town three, or you can go through town two, or you can do this little deviation to town four, but there's a bunch of different um, uh, routes. So you have alternate systems and routes that can be used to lead to the same outcome. That's a robust system, and you see this uh, quite a lot in biology where there's another um, pathway or method that achieves the same goal. Multiple enzymes that um, can fill a function. So what genes are found in the genome? All right, so humans and worms have similar numbers of protein coding genes, okay? But humans make way more gene products, okay? And this mechanism is called alternative splicing, where we have, uh, so here's our coding region up here. Uh, we have some exons, one, two, three, four, and some introns, those, the, these yellow spaces here. And so our initial RNA transcript contains both introns and exons, but we can splice that in different way. So one way we remove the introns here and we get this interesting amino acid here. 
and over in this pathway, the second exon was skipped, and we have a slightly different polypeptide. Okay, now both of these proteins are from the same DNA sequence, but they're slightly different. So they're called isoforms, okay, and if they were alternatively spliced. And what this does is gives us a lot of more variation in uh, proteins via the same amount of DNA. So without having to put more um, energy into DNA uh, replication and, and such, you can get a higher number of functional proteins at the end, which is kind of helpful and beneficial. So the fact that we can make a bunch of different protein products from a single gene is interesting, but we also have a whole lot of genes that we have in common with other species. And so these are called orthologs, equivalent genes that are a result of a shared ancestry of two species. So here's um, a human gene and a dog gene. Uh, this is for cytochrome C oxidase subunit, which is a highly conserved gene throughout um, animals and other um, organisms. And humans and dogs share most of the amino acid residues here in this particular uh, protein. I'll turn off my thing. So uh, we share about a quarter of our genes, have an, some equivalent with E. coli, 30 to 50 percent in yeast. And once we get to mice, we've got about 96 percent of our genes are equivalent with something in mice. And then in chimpanzees, we're up to 99 percent. Uh, there are really only 200 genes that are specific to humans from chimpanzees and about 150 genes in chimps that are specific to them. So, but that's not the only differences in the genome because we also have to think about our uh, regulation pathways, um, promoters and non-coding RNAs are also vastly different as well. So these um, equivalent genes, these orthologs reflects our shared ancestry and that the very really core cellular processes of how cells produce energy and, and use it are all um, very similar across the, the kingdoms.